Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well and welcome to today's bonus. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadalny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. Finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump into today's bonus, shall we? Today's first part of the upload. September 3rd, 1988, Lee County, South Carolina. 17-year-old youth who created an international lizard man frenzy has passed a polygraph test about his encounter with a seven-foot creature, his promoters say. Polygraph experts say that means Davis believes he saw what he said he saw, a red-eyed greenish creature that chased him on a rural county road. Others put as much stock in polygraphs as they do the lizard man. Lee County Sheriff Lisden Truesdale said another eyewitness claims in sworn statement to have crossed paths with the creature last fall. Yet another man reported seeing a brownish creature about eight feet tall eight days ago. Truesdale's office investigated and the sheriff said he will administer a polygraph test to that man, a colonel living in Lee County next week. Everyone who reports seeing something will be given a polygraph test, Truesdale states. Sumner Police Captain Earl Barry administered Davis's polygraph August 18th at the Sumter City County Law Enforcement Center. The test was paid for by Southern Marketing Incorporated, a company formed by two Sumter men to arrange personal appearances for Davis and Barry. Said that he could not release the results. Davis said his father wanted him to undergo the exam to prove I'm telling the truth. Rick Walsh, a former Sumner police detective and a partner with Randy Galway in Southern Marketing, said he and Galway arranged to have the test done to satisfy our minds. Some in the media are saying he might be on drugs or strung out on drugs. What put the icing on the cake was one weekend. We had some young boys picking on him, so we wanted to set the record straight. Walt said the questions Davis correctly answered included, Was the creature that attacked your car green and black? Were you drinking or smoking drugs? Were you really driving 35 miles an hour when the creature jumped on your car? Did it occur immediately following your changing a flat tire? While police rely on polygraph exams as an investigative tool, Often, confessions results are rarely allowed in court because of temptations that polygraph testing is not an exact science. We've long been opposed to them because of the unreliable and invasiveness. They're probably as reliable as the Lizard Man story itself, said Charles Taylor, director of the Carolina Alliance for Fair Employment. About 10% of those undergoing polygraph exams, including people who suffer from mental illness, like psychosis, schizophrenia, and paranoia, would not be good polygraph subjects, and probably would provide inconclusive results, veteran examiner Frank Falk states. If a person really believes he didn't commit a crime, or was so drunk he doesn't remember it, he could possibly pass, states Falk who retired in 1978 after 27 years as a state law enforcement division chief polygraph examiner. Truesdale said he had been looking for another Browntown resident 
who told a deputy in June he saw a creature in the swamp last fall. The deputy didn't put much stock into the story until Davis made his claim. What adds credibility to his story is that we know about him before we knew about Chris Davis, the sheriff said. We've been looking for him and cannot find him. In an August 13th statement, George Holman Jr., a 31-year-old construction worker, said he had ridden a bike to a flowing spring about 12 in the morning one day last fall. Holman drank some water, lit a cigarette, turned around, and saw it cross the road, Truesdale states. What he described he thought was a dead tree that had been struck by lightning, then it moved. The sheriff said Holman described it between seven to eight feet tall. It stood up like a man, Truesdale said. A car passed by, and that's when he saw the eyes. He said they glowed when the car passed. The creature went back into the swamp after the car passed, Holman told the sheriff. He told it was a hant, what rural folks call ghosts. The sheriff said Truesdale said Holman told no one of the encounter. When he did tell his family, his brother thought he was going fool. So really quick, this is proof that this boy was telling the truth. I mean, and it, it's funny because you have people who are always going to be objective. Like, honestly, I and many of you could photograph a dog man, a Sasquatch, a reptilian. Like, 100% photograph it. Bam. No dicking around with the picture quality or anything, submit it, and there'd be some skeptic or multiple skeptics to just say, no, that's fake, you're lying, this and that. That's what we get faced with on a daily basis because we know that these things exist. It's not that we believe. We actually know. Believing is a word where you're still kind of on the fence in my eyes. Anyway, let's move on, guys. Today's second part of the upload, we will jump from reptilian to goat man. A couple of months back, I was filling out an application for two of my kids to attend Fort Worth's Camp Carter this summer. The TV was on and a rerun Friday the 13th was playing. I recognized the sound effects before I even looked up at the screen. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Ah, 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 ah. The moment was goosebumpy instance for deja vu, but it wasn't Jason. I was remembering it was the Lake Worth monster. My parents sent me to Camp Carter in 1977. I was 10 years old, and for five days we hiked, swam, and learned how to water ski. We played capture the flag, staged cabin raids, and had massive pillow fights. And on the last night of the session, we camped out in the hills surrounding Lake Worth. We ate hot dogs and roasted marshmallows. We played hide and seek. We double dared each other to sneak further and further out into the hills away from the campsite. And then we sat down around the campfire, which was now mostly glowing coals for a few jokes and a ghost story. Even at the tender age of 10, I was no lightweight. I'd been scared weathered by hundreds of episodes of Night Gallery in the Twilight Zone. And I'd seen every episode of Kolchak and the Night Stalker at least twice. As seasoned as I was, I still was not prepared for the yarn that came next. Our cabin counselor was a masterful storyteller. He admitted that no one knew for sure where it had come from or why it was there. He said some folks called it the Goat Man and that it had first been spotted a few years back. He said people who had seen the goat man reported that it had scales like fish and fur like a goat, but walked upright like a man. He told us that sometimes you could hear its strange howl at the night, that it had attacked some teenagers, and had even been shot at by the police. Lately, it had been coming out of the hills and wandering around Camp Carter. He said a few sessions back the creature had used the short broken end of a helicopter blade to slice through a cabin window screen and take a camper around our age. No one had heard a thing. The camp 
had been closed down for two weeks while the police scoured the hills for clues. But the case had never been solved. He told us that we were a part of the first session back since the camp had reopened and that he admired our courage. We'd made it through the camp with no incidents so far, but he wanted us to be careful just in case and confine ourselves to the lighted areas at all times. He said the goat man didn't like being seen, so if we stayed close to the well-lit campsite, we'd have nothing to worry about. It lives in the hills, I asked. You've never found the missing camper, another inquired. We found a pair of glasses, the counselor said, and a sock with specks of blood on it. We were enthralled. We were excited. We were only mildly frightened until all the lights in the camp suddenly went black and we heard a ghastly piercing shriek. Then, for what seemed like an eternity, the dark was full of as much mayhem and mortal terror as a platoon of ten-year-olds could endure. We screamed and wailed on the verge of tears, not sure whether to run or hide, just before we trampled over each other and the camp devolved into utter hysterics, the lights came back on. The joke was on us. But it was over. We laughed about it until it was time to go to bed, then most of us fell asleep with our flashlights on. That was 32 years ago. The real events and the origin of our camp counselor's tale actually transpired eight years earlier. Initial sightings began around the late June 1969. The Fort Worth Police Department started receiving reports about something that was frightening folks around Lake Worth. The police dispatcher at the time was quoted as saying that they simply laughed them off as pranks. Then in the wee hours of July 10th, just after midnight, John Richart and his wife and two other couples were parked together at Lake Worth near Green Gear Island. They were simply taking in the view when something suddenly leapt from a nearby tree onto their vehicle. The thing tried to grab Richard's wife, but he drove away before it could reach her and immediately contacted the police. Four police units responded to the Richard's call and inspected the site of the attack. They found nothing except an 18-inch scratch down the side of Richard's car. That, every witness claimed, was caused by the creature grasping claw. The victims described their attacker as part man and part goat, and claimed that it had been covered with fur and scales. The police again suspected that it was some kind of prank, but made a serious investigation anyway because, as patrolman James S. McGee observed, the Richards and their friends were genuinely terrified. Later in the day, the June 10th afternoon edition of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram featured a front-page story on the thing that had attacked the Richards. It read, Fishy Man, Goat Terrifies Couple Parked at Lake Worth. Hot off the presses, the Lake Worth monster was introduced to Cowtown, and the word traveled fast. By late that afternoon, there were related television and radio reports. By midnight, several carloads of people had gathered in and around the gear Greer Island Refuge and Nature Center to see the Lake Worth monster for themselves. They were not disappointed. After being spotted just off a of park road, the creature appeared on a high bluff just off the lake. There were 30 to 40 witnesses, including members of the Tarrant County Sheriff's Department, according to an eyewitness accounts. The creature appeared agitated and hurled a spare tire approximately 500 feet toward the crowd. Subsequently, everyone, including the sheriff's deputies, jumped in their car and fled. The next day, the Star-Telegram ran another front-page story that read, Police, residents observe, but can't identify the monster. The story was accompanied by a photo of the bluff from which the creature was seen hurling the spare tire. In the foreground, witness Jack Harris and Ronnie Armstrong stood next to the tire. In the background, the Star-Telegram art department superimposed a dashed line indicating the path of the tire's trajectory. Harris confirmed earlier reports, noting that the creature walked like a man, but did not look like one. He was whitish-gray and hairy, Harris said. 
I might have been scared, but he looked like he was seven feet tall and must have weighed 300 pounds. Harris described the creature's howl as pitiful cry, like something was hurting him. He tried to take a picture of the monster, but his flash did not work. Sergeant A.J. Hudson, the officer who investigated the sighting, was not worried about the creature so much as the small mob looking for it. Apparently, some of the monster hunters had been carrying guns and Hudson was afraid someone would be hurt. Jim Mars, the original reporter on the story, sought the opinion of two local experts. Helmuth Numur, the curator of the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, said the creature was probably a cat. Richard Pratt, the naturalist in charge of Greer Island Refuge and Nature Center, now known as Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge, concurred. Pratt said somebody had previously released a pet bobcat in the park, and it may be responsible for the reports, especially since the cat liked people and was accustomed to sitting on tree branches. In the early hours of July 12th, carloads of curious seekers once again descended on Greer Island, Refuge and Nature Center hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature. But this time they had no luck. The monster was a no-show, and the police were relieved. As the Star-Telegram put it in a short blurb entitled, What is it takes the night off? The police were still concerned that somebody might accidentally get shot. Tarrant County Sheriff Lon Evans told Dallas Morning News that he didn't think the creature existed. There may have been a prankster going around out dressed up like some kind of monster, he said. If he is, it's a good way to get themselves shot. Evans also teased a theory approaching Freud's notion of communal neurosis. There's also the possibility that some people have hypnotized themselves, Evans continued, and are convinced that they saw some kind of apparition, although they did not actually so. For the next few days, interested parties continued to cruise around Greer Island after midnight looking for the creature, but they saw neither hide nor hair nor scale of it. On July 14th, the Star-Telegram featured a short Tarrant Today brief entitled, Go Seen on Greer Island. The author, Jim W. Jones, reported that Fort Worth resident named Kyle Kinson had, in addition to seeing the Lake Worth monster, also witnessed apparitions that appeared in a mysterious mist. Kinson claimed the ghosts were see-through. It's hard to explain, Kinson said, and I know it sounds crazy. We thought it was some kind of trick at first. Kinson indicated that he and others had encountered the monster and the ghost on several occasions, but only when visitors were sparse and the park was quiet. When Jones asked Kinson how the ghost responded, when they were spotted, Kinson said that he and his companions never stuck around long enough to find out. A few days after July 10th sighting, a local artist named Joe Pack came forward with a sculpture of the creature which he had created after listening to details he had gathered through eyewitness accounts. The Star-Telegram ran the short story and accompanying a photo of Pack and the plastered rendering on July 17th. The Associated Press Wire picked up the image and it appeared in the Dallas Morning News on July 20th. On the 18th of July, the creature made the Star-Telegram editorial page in a piece entitled, Lake Worth Monster, a Jolly Good Sport. The newspaper staffer stated that to be a paranormal or sportive apparition whose purpose is to amaze, sometimes shock, but seldom cause lasting anguish. And as far as proof of the creature's existence, the article concluded that the Loch Ness Monster has existed for generations on evidence neither so well documented nor half so entertaining. The creature's trail grew cold after Jones' Tarrant Today mention, and it did not reappear again for almost four months. Then, on November 7th, Charles Buckman reported that the creature attacked him while he was sleeping in his sleeping bag in the back of his truck in the hills across from Greer Island, 
Bachman claimed that he made his escape by pushing a bag of chicken toward the beast, which it promptly stuffed in its mouth before returning to the lake and swimming back to the island. With the 60s coming to an end and local and national headlines being dominated by the United States astronauts landing on the moon, documented sightings of the creature became scarce. In the late 69, Fort Worth resident Sally Ann Clark self-published a 119-page book on the subject entitled The Lake Worth Monster of Greer Island. In it, she provided several eyewitness accounts and photos identifying the witnesses and last known whereabouts of the creature and many of the aforementioned newspaper clippings. Ronnie Armstrong reemerges in Figures prominently in the amateur investigation indicated that the creature had been wounded at some point, and one photo depicts Armstrong identifying a blood sample taken from a pool of blood and blood spatters leading to the water's edge. The caption below the photo claims that several large tracks were also found in the area, and that Armstrong and Clark believed they belonged to the creature. Another photo identifies Fort Worth resident Gary Sanford, and several teenagers from Diamond Hill, noting that the boys had originally referred to the creature as the mud monster, and they had been chasing it for more than three years. The book also identified Fort Worth residents Mr. and Mrs. James Bromlett and Linda Gilman of Palm Springs, California, all claiming they have heard the monster in the area and discovered dead mangled sheep that they believed to be its handiwork. The creature then appeared to take an easterly sabbatical. In 1971, a group of hunters reported seeing Goatman in Marshall, Texas. Then it resurfaced in Tarrant County, but appeared to pond jump on the evening of March 13, 1973. Mark Frickle a 19-year-old security officer at Carswell Air Force Base had approached the seven-foot-tall creature, which looked like a large bear, at Benbrook Lake. Frickle had been relaxing at the Holiday Park, listening to the radio and enjoying a soft drink. He reported he heard a scream and turned and immediately saw an unidentifiable creature splash through the shallows and disappear into the surrounding brush. He phoned the Benbrook Police Department, and they responded with a search party, but no trace of the creature was ever found. The incident made a March 14th edition of the Dallas Morning News under a headline that asked, Has Monster of Lake Ended Hibernation? In 1975, the Lake Worth monster appeared again, but this time on a stage at the Fort Worth Art Museum, rather than prowling around Lake Worth or splashing through the shallows of Benbrook Lake. On this occasion, Johnny Simmons, a co-founder of Fort Worth's nationally acclaimed Hip Pocket Theater, wrote and produced the stage version of the Lake Worth Monster and submitted it as partial fulfillment of the requirements for his Masters of Fine Arts at TCU. In the 80s, perhaps after pond jumping, once more a goat man began being reported around White Rock Lake in Dallas. Witnesses claimed the creature to be seven feet tall and had the body of a man but hooves and horns of a goat. In 1993, Dallas Morning News published the top ten lists demonstrating why the Pentagon should continue to buy F-16 fighter jets. The number ten reason was a bomber plant is ideal obstacle to keep the Lake Worth monster from attacking White Settlement. July of 1999, the Star-Telegram published the 30th anniversary piece entitled 30 Years Ago, A Strange Whatever Terrorized Lake Worth. It simply rehashed most of what the newspaper had already published about the monster and noted that Jim Mars had recently indicated a group of teenage pranksters from Brewer High School were rumored to have been behind the creature, and they'd given up their antics to avoid prosecution. An October 2003 edition of the Texas Parks and Wildlife 
Larry D. Hodge again reworked most of the Star Telegram clippings, but added a new and startling twist. Richard Pratt had given him the name of the local teenager who actually confessed to his participation in the July 11, 1969 Lake Worth Monster appearance. According to Hodge, Pratt said the Lake Worth Monster and his accomplice raised a ruckus on the bluff above the curious onlookers and law enforcement officers and then pushed the tire off the side of the bluff toward the crowd. Hodge indicated that Pratt gave him the name of the kid and he was still living within miles of his wily exploits, but incognito and off the proverbial grid. In October of 2005, an unconfirmed and little documented sighting of the creature occurred again at Holiday Park on Lake Benbrook. An anonymous witness claimed the monster surprised him during the early morning swim. It was pushing through a stand of reeds about 200 yards from me, the source said. The reeds came up to my chest, but only re reached the animal's waist. It appeared to walk upright, grunting in a belabored manner. The anonymous witness also reported never spotted the creature, and he quickly and quietly returned to his truck on the shore and watched it disappear. On July 8th, 2006, the Star-Telegram revisited the subject once again, 37 years after snapping photo. Bigfoot talk gets man's goat. In it, staff writer Bud Kennedy spoke with Alan Pulser, the only man ever to get a picture of the creature. Pulser, the owner of the House of Allen Women's Boutique at the time, said he snapped a Polaroid of the monster when he was driving with his friends along the shore one night during what Kennedy's terms was monster fever. Polster indicated that something furry stood alongside the road, and a female companion screamed, Look, 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 there it is! And he captured an image of it as it ran away. The photo wound up with Sally Ann Clark and now appears on a Bigfoot website all over the internet. As indicated by the title of Kennedy's piece, Polster now distances himself from the authenticity of the picture because he believes the monster he captured in the Polaroid wanted to be seen. So, really quick, um, on this one, <laughs> I have to, I'm challenging whoever came out and said, oh, it was me in 1969, because there were numerous people there. And they claim that the tire was thrown, not just bumped off by a couple of kids or, you know, it was one thing and it threw. Um, numerous sightings all around that area. So it couldn't have been a prankster, if you, you know what I'm saying. You know, I mean, we're, we're going back some time and then moving forward into the future, there's still these sightings. So, you know, whatever this guy in 1969 is claiming he did, I doubt. I highly do. Uh, the one that kind of was definitely creepy to me was the guy that was at the uh, Holiday Park and how he said, how he described it. Um, because there was numerous different sightings. Um, there was some that said it had scales, some that stated that it didn't. There was one that almost sounded like a dog man to me. Um, just crazy amounts of, you know, some that said it had short black hair, some that said it was white and gray. So I'm not sure. I mean, no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't believe in it. What I'm saying is I definitely know there's something there. I don't think that it was a prankster because we all know that if there's one Bigfoot or one dog man, there's more than one with them. So why wouldn't it be one very huge white one, one 
smaller, blackish, grayish. So, you know, I'm just, I really, dis, I, I have to say the guy who in 69 is a, a jerk off and he's looking for fame. And that's just my, my view on that. I mean, we're going from the Marshall sighting to Ben Brook to White Rock. I mean, these are distances. These aren't just like, so, I mean, that's just me and I'll always fight for the monster. Moving on. Today's third part of the upload brings us to Penobscot, Maine. The Penobscot County Ridge Monster, 1988. This is an encounter from Eastern United States, Maine. This event took place about 10 years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. My father and I were fishing for brook trout in Northern Maine woods in 1988. I would have been around 13 years old at the time and my father was 38. It was a beautiful early summer day and the fish were biting. This particular area of Maine woods is extremely thick and dark. Almost gives you the feeling that someone or something is watching you. We were wading down the brook when we noticed a half-eaten remain of a snowshoe hare lying on the bank of the brook. On closer examination, we noticed the head of the hare had been halfway eaten. My father didn't think too much of it since he's an avid outdoorsman and has seen nature at work before, but myself, a young boy, was amazed at the sight, and after poking and prodding at the remains with a stick moving on down the brook, we noticed the water in the brook had been disturbed, and since the water was moving slowly, it happened recently. Even I noticed this at my young age, but we both didn't think much of it until later that night when we recapped the amazing day. Anyway, back to the encounter. We had caught our limit of the brook trout for the day and were heading back to the truck, which was parked about five miles away at the end of a logging road. This is the road we followed on the way out. When I say logging road, I mean an old logging road, which has not been logged in over 30 years and was very grown over, but made for easier walking than through the thick cedars. We didn't talk much on our way down the road until we came across an old cabin deep in the woods. We stopped to sit down for a while and rest. We noticed a log book on the table and we read it and throughout the book were entries about the owners of the cabin seeing the Ridge Monster, as they called it, and they gave details about the creature, which now matches ours. Rested, we proceeded to walk down the trail when all of a sudden my dad stopped dead in his tracks. I figured he was taking another break, so I stopped to examine some flowers on the ground. When I looked at my dad, I saw the face on him I'd never seen before and hoped to never see it like that again. He was looking toward a small opening in the forest for perhaps 15 to 20 seconds. I became concerned and asked him what he was looking at since female moose have their young at this time of the year and are usually very protective. We had seen plenty that day when he suddenly grabbed me and told me to hurry. My father was very uneasy. We made the five mile trip out of the woods and back to the truck in record time. I still have no idea why my dad was in such a hurry. And it was hard for me to keep up with him since I was so small and he was a man well over six feet. When we got back to the truck, he told me to get in in a tone of voice I dared not to disobey. On the ride home, he told me the incredible story of what he had seen. At the time we rounded the small corner in the trail, my dad caught movement out of the corner of his eye. When he looked up, he saw what could only have been a Bigfoot, the main ridge monster. My dad described the creature as being at least 8 feet tall and estimates it weighing over 500. The creature had one long arm grasped a tree and one foot up on a slope in the forest floor and remained there staring at my dad and myself for about 15 to 20 seconds. My dad said the cre creature seemed to be bored with us all of a sudden and simply pulled itself up with one hand grasping the tree and silently disappeared into the woods. My dad, through sheer terror for my sake and to maintain sanity, never told me until we got to the truck. 
Imagine what I would have thought when he told me a 500 pound mythical creature was within 20 yards of us. I never saw the creature, only my dad did. And he was amazed not only at the incredible sight itself, but the agility and stealth of it. My father and I were then concluded we startled the creature feeding on the hair down by the shore of the brook. It followed us throughout the day out of curiosity while keeping its distance. When I thought about all of the stories I had heard over the years and how the smell accompanies the creature, I did notice a strange smell when we stopped on the trail, but that could have been the smell of the Cedar Swamp Spring. The brook has no name where we were fishing. It was early summer to late spring 1988, about 10 in the morning. I don't remember the direction of the wind, but the prevailing winds usually blow northeast. I did notice a faint smell, but not strong as some I have read about. The most significant thing one remembers of the creature was the huge size and the silence it possesses in its movement. My dad believes it was a male, since there were no breasts. The creature appeared to be in good health, was fast and strong. We have heard Maine Indian stories of a gentle giant, as they call it, that has lived in the Maine woods since the Indians first settled there, and many sightings have been made in modern time. My father is a well-respected man in our community, and has never told anyone <clears throat> outside of our family and plans to keep it that way. All right, folks, an assortment of just horrifying experiences. I hope you enjoyed them all as much as I enjoyed sharing them with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps the channel growing and going and what gives people a chance to share their experiences, ideas, theories, judgment-free, just simply treated with the respect we deserve. Thank you. Stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, friends. These creatures are real. They are out there. They are definitely dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.